weeks away. Sainz has driven for the team before, but his last Ford was a Sierra Cosworth in 1988. This would be his first chance to drive the Escort Cosworth he'll be using this year. You have balaclavas, by chance? Balaclavas. With temperatures well below freezing, even in mid-afternoon, the cold would be a problem for the crew and the mechanics. Balaclavas would be essential items. The Spanish pair were soon in the car, getting used to their office for the year ahead. A new car meant new switchgear, and even new headset sockets had to be learnt. Where do we plug okay. it in? The blue one is uh, normally the one for the pelter, mm -hmm. when you have the headset and the radio. You have the radio through. The yellow one is the stage one for the crash helmet. In temperatures that can reach 20 degrees below freezing, reliability is the key to success. Last year's Swedish rally ended in retirement for the entire Subaru team with engine failure. Sainz and his teammates Colin McRae and Bats Jonsson didn't even reach the final afternoon, so Carlos will be hoping that he'll have better luck with the Ford team in 96. Test days like this play an important part in selecting suspension, transmission and tyre combinations, so it was time to get on with the day's work. Considering it was Sainz's first real chance to drive the car, the first few runs of the day were pretty impressive. The Swedish rally itself is run in conditions far worse than these, although the weather in mid-December was ideal for this test session. After those first few runs, Sainz pronounced himself pleased at both his and the car's performance. We just made our first run in the car. Of course, everything is new for me and I have to, to learn a little bit about the car, uh, to learn a little bit about everything to adjust the car a bit for, for my driving style because uh, I think that's very important to, to build up all the confidence. For the mechanics, the intense cold creates unique problems. When you see what happens to this block of ice when it hits a brake pad, imagine dropping a hot wheel nut into deep snow. At times like that, you just hope there's a spare in the service van. For the test team engineers, the session's vital. It's the first chance they've had to set up the Escort to suit Carlos. Make sure the car is stable where the conditions change, where the ice gets rutted and the snow depths change, that the car is stable over lots of different and changing conditions so that the driver can push hard and have total confidence in the car all the time. He mustn't be nervous of the car or wondering what it's going to do next. You know, he commands the car and the car mustn't be doing anything that's not expected. At the start of the test, the car had a fairly neutral setup. Although, as the day wore on, electronic active front and centre differentials and several different suspension settings, both front and rear, were tried out. He has a, a certain style of left foot braking that's maybe different to our previous drivers. So some of the centre differential settings have to be changed. We just have to understand his style, just so it's the, the right balance for him and his, his ability and, and how he throws the car around compared to another driver. Tire choice here, just as on every other World Championship rally, is crucial. Engineers from Michelin had travelled to Sweden to offer advice on choosing tyres. Sainz, remember, has been driving on the Pirellis used by the Subaru team for the last couple of years. Despite the fact that it's the driver who makes most of the decisions, world rallying is very much a partnership. Surprisingly, perhaps, Lewis Moyer also enjoys testing. Well, in fact, I like it. I like to do it. Because then I know what we're doing during the rally. And you know, we have to change something, which direction are we going? Because if I'm not coming to the test, then I will know less about the car, especially when it's a new car. And during the test, what I'm doing, I'm reading the notes and then I'm writing the comments of Carlos, and also Carlos asks me questions, if, how I feel the car, or, but I'm not as, as good as him, you know, I can give my opinions. But always we talk together, we take the decisions always together. Nighttime in Sweden comes at around four in the afternoon, although it doesn't mean the end of the test. By the time you see this in the UK, Sainz and Moyer will have reached the end of day one of the Swedish rally, and will know whether all the testing was worth it. Back in December though, Carlos appeared pretty satisfied with the day's work. Yes, of course the first day, you know, it's always everything new, you, you need to learn everything, especially here in the snow, has been a good first day.
1995 marked the last year of the Renault Clio Championship to be replaced in 96 by the new Spyder two-seater sports car. It was a season-long battle between Lee Brooks and David Shaw, a close contest that was a bit too close on occasions. It all began at Donington in April, with Brooks on pole position, determined to better his third place in the 94 series. Right behind him was the equally ambitious 94 runner-up Shaw, but it wasn't going to be his day. Brooks led a neat and tidy pack down to the first corner, and amazingly, they all got round without hitting each other. Brooks won as he pleased, but for Shaw there was a broken gear linkage and no points. Brooks won again as a wet brand's hatch, while Shaw got tangled up with Glenn Board and had his window punched in. Still, he recovered to salvage fourth place. He followed that with a win at Thruxton and then again at Silverstone. But Brooks was never far away. Already, the championship looked like a two-horse race. Lee Gitt got the jump on me at the start. The first few laps, I was happy to sit behind him. I felt I was uh, quicker than him. Uh, until I got past him on about lap six and then as soon as I was ahead of him I felt he was quicker than me so it was a real struggle to stay ahead and uh, we had a couple of uh, touches but all, all very friendly you know we're, we're both, all both close to the limit and you can't get past without making a desperate move and I knew Lee wouldn't do that so it's a good race but it's, it's certainly the best race I've had there's a lot of eyes on you in this championship and uh, there has been a lot of incidents with yellow flags etc and bad driving standards so we're all taking care not to do anything that uh, might uh, raise the attention of the clerk of the course. All polite smiles so far, with honours even. Brooks then won a tight encounter at Alton. Another at Brands Hatch. And then the next two rounds as well. So when the teams went to Knockhill in Scotland for round nine, Brooks was looking to make it five on the trot. Down to the first corner, he tried to squeeze Poleman Shaw to the inside, but Shaw held his ground and Brooks spun himself round and then parked his Clio on its roof, sending the pack scattering in all directions. Shaw was later black flagged for a totally separate incident, but even that failed to bring a smile to Brooks's face. Well, that did give Guy Povey the chance to celebrate being the only other man to win a Clio race in 1995. Shaw came back with two more wins, then took the lead at Alton Park, only to find Brooks fight back and then once again spin himself round the front of Shaw's Clio. Mrs Brooks wasn't amused. He's off. He's off. He's But the tears of frustration turned to smiles of joy in the final round at Silverstone where Lee Brooks took the winner's flag for the seventh time and confirmed himself as champion. I can't believe it at the moment. Still not registered that I'm the champion yet. We had some real good results at the beginning of the season and um, really we've been consistent all the way through the season. Uh, the team's done an excellent job. Photographs and adulation then after a very close fought and controversial year of Renault Clio racing. I'm in Dovey Forest in Mid Wales for the Midland Rally, the last of the seven rounds of the Mintex National Rally Championship. Now the last time we looked at this series was back in the spring, round two, Aberdeen for the Granite City Rally. The series was to develop into a four-way fight, but after this little escapade, George Gold wasn't part of it. One of the four, Murray Grierson in his Subaru Legacy, was keen to win his first Mintex series and put in a storming drive to win the Granite City. 94 champion Chris Mellers was getting to grips with his ex Delacour Escort and grabbed second spot. Local man David Gillanders could only manage third, but after his win on the first round, he still led the championship. The fastest and only all tarmac round of the Mintex series is the Manx National in midsummer. Murray Grierson pirouetting on the unfamiliar tarmac didn't help himself a lot, 
but he flew over the 120 mile route to finish seven. His championship hopes still alive. If Grierson was ill at ease on the tarmac, Gil Anders positively hated it. He's always voiced his dislike of the black stuff and was happy to take 10th overall and 16 championship points. The Manx National uses many of the roads of the Manx International later in the year, but it's unsuitable territory for a safari rally spec Mitsubishi Galant. Nevertheless, the fourth of the championship contenders, Steve Hill and Stella Boyles, were going well. At times. 91 champion Trevor Smith was up with the leaders, but left the Manx attack after hitting a concrete block. Chris Mellers took second overall in the Isle of Man and now led the series. Back on the mainland for the Kerridge Rally in Mid Wales. Gillanders was again on form, but the ebullient Abedonian suffered two punctures and third was the best he could manage. Murray Grierson was also on song. The Subaru was in its element, and the 87 and 93 Scottish champion took control of the rally until sidelined by a broken cam belt. With others in the wars and non-championship contender John Roberts winning outright, Steve Hill took maximum points on the carriage. Mellors was in trouble. Into Watch carefully. Steve's in-car camera shows where a minor off at the end of a straight loses Chris a full five minutes. And left four, and long right five. Despite their off, Chris Mellers and Brian Goff clawed back to seventh place here and kept that important championship lead ahead of Gillanders, Hill and Grierson. Steve Petch was in exuberant form on round five, the Morganug rally in South Wales. He went on to take second place in the Group N championship behind Jeremy Eason. Dry dust was a real problem in these unfamiliar forests. Gillanders had to stop twice and could only finish sixth. Steve Hill is noted for his consistent driving, and his ex-Shinazuka safari car was in its element here in the rocky and dusty condition. Although he started the day in third place in the championship, he suffered a number of punctures here and dropped to seventh place on the Morganwood. Nevertheless, he was clearly enjoying himself. After leading the rally, Mellers holed his escort's radiator and he went off for two minutes. He still finished sixth. For once, luck was on Murray Grierson's side. Although he and Stuart Merry had dropped to fourth place in the series, a faultless drive gave them a win here. Yolanda's led the championship, Mellers was second, Hill third. Round six and the fast Yorkshire Forest for the track rod rally. Mellers was back on form and using every inch of the road, clocked up his first win of the series. Murray Grissom knew that if he won the track rod, he'd also win the championship. But the luckless Scott rolled out of the event on the fast Gale Rig stage. David Gillanders took advantage of Grierson's demise and lifted himself back into the championship hunt with a third place here. Steve Hill's faithful Mitsubishi Gallant suffered brake and clutch problems which destroyed his championship hopes. And so it was back to Wales with three drivers still in with a chance of the title. I think the tactics for all of us have to go fairly hard today um, because, you know, each of us needs to win. And uh, the three, three drivers all need to win. It's not second place isn't good enough, so uh, that'll be the tactics. It was possible to win it in the last event, but obviously it backfired there. And uh, it's come down to the wire. Uh, one of three drivers, best man takes all. If you take Murray for a start, he's, he's just had a big accident, so therefore he's maybe a little bit tentative. And uh, Chris, well, you know, he's, he's just a big gangly guy, he'll have a go at it, so um, yeah, it's, um, it's going to be good all the way. It was the ideal championship finale. No one would let up. Mellers was fastest on the first stage, but had brake problems on the second. Grierson started to put in blindingly quick times and stormed through the fast-flowing Gathaniog stage to take the lead and, of course, head the championship. But on the dummy main stage, everything changed. Jeff Smith and Ryland James, after an excellent season, were heading for a Group N win and pass a casualty in the trees. Grierson had crashed out. 
with Grayson's off the bottom. With Grierson gone, the Mintex Championship had become a two-horse race. And David Gillanders, with local ace Howard Davis on the maps, piled on the pressure. Gillanders and Mellors were neck and neck, but there were rumblings in the gearbox department of the Scots Escort. Still a welcome sight, the Lancia Delta into Grali. Steve Smith and Brian Hughes finished third on the Midland. Steve Hill finished fourth overall here, and third in the Mintex Championship ahead of Grierson. Former Scottish champion Drew Gallagher had borrowed Neil Dugan's escort Cosworth and was being egged on by his fellow countrymen. Among the most loyal competitors of the year were Andrea Hall and Sue Mee, but mechanical problems saw them take second spot in the ladies section to the Simonite sisters. The championship regular Peter Stevenson, a rare mistake, but this roll cost him a mere five seconds. Well, this is it. The last stage of the last event in the championship. Whoever comes round this corner first has won. Red and yellow is Gillanders. Blue and white, Mellors. It's blue and white. What did that feel like, that last stage? It felt about 200 miles long. <laughs> it was only six miles, but it felt a long, long way. So, a superb result for Chesterfield's Chris Mellors. Two Mintex championships in two years. And he'll be back for a whole new season when it starts again later this month. The 1995 German Touring Car Championship moved to the airfield circuit of Diepholz to start the second half of their season with Michael Bartels the surprise of qualifying. Now I'm on the front row again on pole position and I hope I can do it this time, at least one podium place in, in one of the two races. Alongside the Alfa Romeo of Bartels, the Opel of reigning champion Klaus Ludwig while his teammate Keke Rosberg was back in ninth. At the start, Bartels got away cleanly, but Ludwig was slow and Alessandro Nanini's Martini Alpha grabbed second ahead of the brown Mercedes of Jörg van Omen. Further back, his teammate Jan Magnussen in the other brown Mercedes cut across from the outside and headed for the apex of the corner, but then spun lazily to a halt. The replay shows Rosberg's yellow opal emerging from the trio behind and then diving inside Magnussen with the almost inevitable contact. Up front, Bartels led from Nanini, with Dario Franchitti up to third ahead of Ludwig's Opel and then the Mercedes of Van Omen. Paul Magnussen's day got worse as he struggled back to the pits with a shredded tyre, lapsed by the charging leaders. Championship leader Bernd Schneider in the second of the Silver Arrows was back in seventh and treating the chicane curbs with a certain amount of respect. Something a fired up Klaus Ludwig probably wished he'd done because if you don't, the penalty can be severe. It was another bad day for the champion after a promising grid position and his second place at the Norris Ring was still the best result of the season for the whole Opel team. By mid-race, Frank Kitty had taken second from Nanini who was then passed by teammate Nicola Lorini. But up front, there was no stopping Michael Bartels, who stormed home for his first race win in six years. I did not one little mistake. I was controlling the race from the start. I was on pole position. I mean, what I can expect more. <laughs> race two, and Bartels led again, with Frank Kitty behind in a martini sandwich. Nanini on the outside came across and crowded the Mercedes, but the young Scott braved it out, braked last, clipped Nanini, and then ran round the outside of Larini. Great stuff. Driving right on the ragged edge, Dario took the fight to the Alphas and on lap five, dive-bombed Bartels to take the lead. But his glory was short-lived as clutch problems intervened and dropped him back to finally finish fourth. Team Rosberg's day was going from bad to worse, with Keke running out of brakes and Klaus Ludwig, with new suspension, running out of oil. But at least he had the courtesy to burn it off. So Michael Bartels came home to win again, hounded all the way by Nicola Larini. It was a good day for Alpha, but could they hold back the Mercedes Tide? Four weeks later, and the circus were back on a proper racing circuit, the Nürburgring, but sadly only on the new track. 
and Mercedes were back on top, Schneider on pole with Magnussen alongside. But any thoughts of victory for the young Dane disappeared at the first corner as the sequential gearbox refused to downchange and he shot across the dirt. While further back, Ellen Law spun out of the midfield. Schneider led from Frankitti, Kurt Tim, Larini and Sandy Grau in the second yellow Mercedes, ahead of the Opals of Rosberg and Manuel Reuter. But there were no team orders in the AMG camp. Schneider might have been 22 points ahead in the championship, but Frankitti was free to fight. And fight he did. By lap 7, Dario was past bent, while behind them, Larini was ahead of the two yellow Zaxby Mercedes. Logically, Dario should have won, but on lap 15, Schneider galloped past the stricken Scott, sidelined with a broken clutch. In the Opel camp, Rosberg held off Reuter to finish fourth, his best result of the season. But with Frankitti gone, Schneider was untouchable, posting his fourth win ahead of Lorini's Alpha and Grau's Mercedes. Race two was forgettable, except that Grau in the yellow Mercedes beat Larini into second place at the first corner, and that was the finishing order 23 laps later. On then to Silly Singen, and another street circuit made up of 90 degree corners and chicanes that require more brute force than finesse. Mercedes was still at the front, this time with Dario on pole and Kurt Tim alongside just three hundredths of a second slower. And it was Tim who led away at the start from Frankitti with the Alphas of Lorini and Nanini behind, ahead of Ludwig's Opel as they fell into their enforced single file. Given the problems of overtaking on the tight circuit, there was little expectation of much excitement, unless someone made a mistake. Fast Lady Ellen Law made this one, but got away with it. Although, I don't think the radio talk was very ladylike. But two Opals into one definitely won't go, and Yannick Dalmas tipped teammate Nee Amorin into the wall, while Michele Alberto only had himself to blame after he tried to give JJ Leto the squeeze. So, Kurt Tim posted his second win of the year, which, like the first at Avers, was on a street circuit where his Michelin tyres seemed more equal to the Bridgestones of the opposition. To add to the Mercedes management's joy, Ben Schneider worked his way up from 14th on the grid to finish 6th and now needed only a few points from race 2 to clinch the championship. At the start, Tim got the jump on Dario and led the field away. Magnussen slotted into third, ahead of Lorini, with Schneider happy to settle into fifth, and that would probably be good enough. Out front, team used every inch of the track, with Frankitti pushing him hard. Behind them, Bernd's task would soon become much easier. First, Lorini slowed with engine problems. And then, Frankitti picked up a puncture, so Ben was third. And when Team's engine blew, it looked like he might even win. But then, Nee Amarin clobbered the barriers hard, and, although he was unharmed, they hung out the red flag and declared the race over. It meant that Kurt Tim had won the second race, as he had the first, and Ben Schneider was German touring card champion. I'm very happy with the results and have to say thank you to my team and to my messianics, they worked very hard. And so, to Hockenheim for the final two rounds of the 13 race series. Mercedes were champions. Alpha had won three times. But Opel were still looking for their first victory. But whatever the result, for their star driver Keke Rosberg, this was to be the last race of a distinguished career. It's been 30 years and has to come to this one day and uh, you can hardly wish for a better coolish than this one, you know. It's a full house to die and it's a tremendous feeling. Not only that, but Opel had qualified second and fourth fastest behind an electrically on-form Dario Franchitti, who'd repeated the pole position he'd gained in the first round here back in April. But into the first chicane, it was Manuel Reuter ahead of Dario, with Klaus Ludwig's Opel under pressure from Van Omen's Mercedes. On lap two, Ludwig was demoted to fourth, but further back, Team and Magnussen tangled and the 94 British Formula 3 champion headed for retirement. With one win and four seconds in his first season, he'd adapted well to the big saloons. Obviously, they're really heavy cars, and it, it takes a lot different driving style. 
and to, to be able to convert yourself to driving these cars is uh, pretty difficult. Difficult or not, the other graduate from British F3, Dario Franchitti, dived past Reuter to take the lead and showed that he too has adapted well. It is a big change to start with. Yeah, the weight is a lot different. The tyres are about the same size as the Formula 3 car, but with twice the weight, three times the horsepower almost. So it's a bit difficult. What about physical fitness? Yeah, they get very hot inside. That's the, the, the biggest problem I had the first race here at Hockenheim. The, um, the heat builds up to sometimes 70 degrees C inside the car. But it was heat on the outside that denied Dario victory at Hockenheim. I got to the, the faraway corner there and it just inside the car I just couldn't see where it was going so I had to pull off and the, the marshals were a little bit slow getting it all put out but that was it, end of the season, a little bit disappointing. And was this also the end of his ambitions to get into Formula One? I hope not, I really hope not. I think this is a better way with Mercedes looking after me now, I think it's a better way to, to get into Formula One. They, their idea is to get me into Formula One, that's their goal and it's my goal so we'll, we'll see what happens in the next couple of years. Klaus Ludwig inherited Dario's lead and went on to win both Hockenheim races to ensure some success for Opel at the end of a difficult season. Today was a fantastic day. If there is a race guard, it, the race guard was on our side. And third place in the championship and two wins today. Unbelievable for me. In Top Gear Motorsport next week, there's a full report on last month's Granada Dakar rally. There's the closely fought final rounds of the European Rallycross Series. Plus what happens when you put a novice behind the wheel of a Formula One Tyrrell in the wet.